I was the reason why you want to uh, have uh, gait analysis done. What was the reason? Well, I've been a runner for 10 years and mm. I've never known if I actually run correctly. Yeah. And actually, maybe as I get older, if I can improve my technique, it yeah, might yeah. help prevent injury and things like that. Yeah, okay. So the type of gait analysis we're going to do is but to understand what's happening mechanically, yeah? When you're walking, when you're running, how the joints behaves. So we're going to analyze all that for you today. Yep. And then we give you the information regarding, obviously, uh, some rehab. Not necessarily we could rehab only when it's an injury. Yeah. When we see is any deficiencies found during gait analysis, that we're going to do a, re a rehabilitation treatment plan for you to follow. It's going to be a little information as well about footwear. It's very important as you run. So it's going to be focused mostly on 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 um, running shoes. Yeah. So what we're going to do is do some tests with and without the shoes so we understand how your foot behaves so we can recommend the right style of shoe with the calculated analysis report. And then some patients um, need, for example, some devices like orthosis, some devices you put inside your shoes to control your foot and yeah. help you with your running and help you with your walking. OK, yeah. the first thing I need from you is um, your weight and height. Okay, Any I'm idea? 63 kilograms, 63 I think. 63 kilograms, yeah. And your height? Uh, 5 foot 6. 5 6, and even 70 meters. <laughs> One sec. One, six, seven should be, yeah. Uh, what's your shoe size? Size 5. 5. So all your running trainers are size 5. They yeah? are. Casual shoe as well, yeah? Yep. Can I see your running trainers? Yes. Okay. Okay, and make sure it's size 5, yeah, 38. You need to put your right foot on here. This is a foot measurement, no a shoe measurement, okay? It's different. So, ideally, uh, that's telling me your foot size is a 4.5. Cool. Uh, that's a foot size, a shoe size we recommend a size larger. So, your ideal shoe size should be a 5.5. Interesting. Yeah, you are wearing, obviously, a size 5. A half a size bigger will be there for you. Usually we recommend to have a centimeter gap between the end of your longest toe and the end of the shoe. That will be the right gap. Okay. Wow. So that's foot size on the right. Uh, let me see on your left. To put a big toe in the middle, just there. Okay. As well, four and a half. Yeah. So definitely shoe size should be a five and a half. Very cool. So I want you to stand on this board. It's called the incline board. We're going to check the flexibility of your calf muscles, which is very important. Okay. Have the right flexibility for running, obviously, walking too, but definitely running. Up here? Board, yes, and try with the two big toes pointing to each other a little bit, like a pigeon toe. Yeah, and I try to put your back straight. Okay, that's pretty good, so you are not really compensating on your spine. Usually people with very calf tight muscles tend to compensate yeah. through the lower back and the spine, so your back looks pretty straight, so that's reasonably good flexibility that's good off the board yeah and now follow me we're going to use this test so okay. on number nine yeah number nine what are we number nine there hands on the wall and then what you need to do um put your hands on the wall yeah what you need to do keep the foot down the heel on the ground don't raise your heel what you need to do you need to try to touch the wall with your knee that's pretty good to so try your for number 10 between nine and ten is what we'd expect so Flexibility is quite good on the right. And now with your left foot, let's try for number nine. <gasps> That's positive. It's positive. Ten, so that means you've been doing your work. <laughs> Positive. Yeah, that's pretty good. If I, if you reach 10, I don't even continue to 11, 12. Can I try it? You can try, yeah. You can see Let me how grab far, my yeah. little, uh, this little one. This is exciting because I'm... Um, it was so much work. It was, but was means you've been working. You'll be working with uh, with your calf flexibility. Then it's 11. showing eleven. That's brilliant. Twelve. Wow, it's pretty good. Is it? Yeah. Not many people can reach twelve. <laughs> That's pretty really good. Do you mind if I get it on yeah, that yeah, camera? Of course, yeah. Sorry. That's all right. Fourteen. Whoa. That one feels tight. It feels tight, yeah. I can see you struggle more to reach the wall. Yeah, definitely it's tighter, but within normal range. But if you compare right and left, definitely it's tighter. Is that centimeters? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah exactly the incline. Um, uh, yeah, it's centimeters to the wall. 
That's very yeah. cool. Okay. That's a great piece of kit. Yes, I'll need to take some measurements. Okay. All right, just lay flat. Okay, just relax. I just want to see if there's an obvious leg, leg discrepancy. Okay, what would you do? Just flex your knees. You bend your knees for me. All right. I just want to loose up your pelvis a little bit. Now, I want you to raise your bum from the couch. Yep. All the way up. And down. Up again. And down. Up again. And down. Very good. I want you to sit up. Try to sit up. And down. Up again. And down. I don't see any evidence of leg discrepancy, which is good. Let's do it one more time. Yeah, up. Yep. Just up and down. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty good. Definitely is no evidence of a true leg leg discrepancy or a postural leg leg discrepancy so far. Just gonna check your subtalar joint. That's pretty good. Checking the rotation of your hips. So we've got a little bit more external rotation than internal. Yeah. Yeah. So now we bend your right knee. It's a little bit restricted internally. Okay. Just bend your right knee. Yeah, bit of restriction. Mm. External rotation is fine. Internal rotation a little bit restricted. Mm. Now, what I want you to do, I just want to raise your right leg up as far as you can go. The hamstrings, pretty good. Now your left. That's pretty good. And I want you to lay on your side facing the window. I'm just going to check your hip abductors and flexors, okay? Just relax your right leg. Just going to hold the leg. I'm going to put my hand on your hips. Okay. Yeah. Pretty good flexibility. Now turn around facing the other way. You're going to flex your right knee and just relax your left. My hand on your hips. Yeah, that's fine. Now facing down on your stomach. I'm gonna check your quads. The overall flexibility is quite good. Yeah. Mm, I do do it uh, daily. Stretching, yeah. Come a little bit farther down. Put your feet over the edge a little bit more. A little bit more. Perfect. I'm just trying to put your subtalar joint in neutral. Your forefoot looks quite level. And your big toe, your first metatarsal, is a slightly plantar flex. You can see you put a lot of pressure under your big toe. Oh, really? Yeah. Is your first metatarsal is a slightly plantar flex, so definitely is going to be more weight and pressure walking right. and running there, okay? I'm going to measure the width of your heel that's one of the measurements we do in case we need to make for example orthotics yeah it's kind of another measurement we need for that that's 57 that's 57 okay turn around on your back again Now, strengthen your legs. We're going to do a test um, 
to check the strength of your muscles around your ankle. Yeah. Oh. Cool. dynamometry. So what we'll do is I will push your foot in one direction, so you have to push back. So you have to resist. As oh, as you very can. cool. But don't move your leg. It's okay. just the movement of your foot. Okay. So what I want you to do is just relax your foot first. Just relax. Okay. And now push back as hard as you can. Let's do it again. Push back as hard as you can. And now push out as hard as you can. Okay. So be stronger, the inverters. I think I could have pushed more going inwards. Yeah, it's just getting, well, we could try again. It's just getting an average. It's mostly this test we will to do is try to compare between the right and the left. Right. Oh, okay. It is a big difference between the two. Yeah, that would be interesting. I sprained my left ankle very badly many years ago, ah, and it. Okay. It. Um. I, th I think so, there's a lot of scar tissue there. Yeah. Is um. They're reasonably strong for that. Sometimes when you sprain your ankle, just push back as hard as you can. And now push back as hard as you can. Yeah. So inverters, your foot inverter muscles are a little bit weaker quite weak in comparison to the inverters. Yeah. Yeah, it's not easy to do. Just push back, rolling in, yeah. Yeah, definitely feels weaker there. And now the same, but pushing out as hard as you can. Yeah, definitely stronger. So much stronger. I was expecting that, yeah. And then we do quickly your left as well. Just relax and now push back as hard as you can. 15, still reasonably weak in comparison to the Vertus, and I push back as hard as you can. Definitely stronger, yeah? 36. Okay. So it's over double. Yeah, we expect that. Usually the uh, one group of muscles are weaker than the others because you tend to pronate. Mm. Yeah, most likely you're going to pronate. We're not sure yet. That's when the foot rolls in excessively. That's 80, 90 degrees. That's pretty good. Mm. Right one first. Okay, I just want to check and we can put your subtalar joint in neutral. Okay, you try to hold your foot in that position, yeah? That would be brilliant. Like that? Yeah, that's perfect. And now just keep your foot still. Wow. As a 3D scanning, that's how we produce and make advanced customized orthotics. That's crazy. Okay, let's be saved. Mega. Brilliant, pretty good. So now we go to the left. Everything is just so clever. Okay, what we're gonna do, look straight ahead. First thing, I uh, need to put markers um, from your neck down, following the curvature of your spine. The lower markers go exactly at this level here, just behind your pelvis, yep. around the sacrilegion. So roll your shoulders down a little bit, up to, let me see the line. Yeah, that's that's perfect. That's there. That's a perfect line. Okay. Is all this all right? Yeah, that's fine. Because I yeah? can take this off. Um, it should be. Are you wearing another sp oh, Okay. Uh, no, actually, it's fine. It's just sports bra. It's fine. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Just look straight ahead. I just want to look at your feet first. We're gonna check foot posture index. It's a little bit low. I'm just gonna put my hands on your pelvis. It's a little bit of left pelvic drop here. Left, yeah. Ooh. Okay, we're standing there. Look, what I want you to do, I want you to roll both feet outward like that at the same time, as far as you can go. And now roll them inwards, all the way in, all the way out, all the way in. All the way out and relax. It's definitely got definitely pronated feet. One foot posture index is around eight. 
use the green. I was rechecking if you had um, a leg leg discrepancy mm -hmm. because in supine or laying flat on the couch, mm -hmm. the legs definitely look the same length, yeah? Yep. But standing, you got a little bit of a pelvic tilt, so it looks like your left pelvis drops a little bit to the left side. As in, yeah, just like that. In, yes, like that a little bit, yeah? So that's obviously when we do the three analyses, we'll focus what is going on on your pelvis. Mm, interesting. When I do squats, mm -hmm. I tend to scoop as well. It yeah. always I can't remember which way, but I'm there's, not sure a, which way there's a scoop there's yeah. a scoop. Yeah. yeah. Quite an obvious scoop. Okay, so where the mark is placed. straight ahead okay good please on the floor okay now stand on the mat and just look straight ahead off the mat we have to do it a few times because I'm calibrating the system first okay back on the mat Off the mat. On. Off. Sometimes takes a while. <laughs> On. Okay, perfect. Just look straight ahead now, okay? Yep. Now, I want you to stand, Laura, onto your left foot. Usually, this is a good test to tell us on the speak that when someone had sprains, ankle sprains in the past, because mm. you're obviously, your proprioception is not great. And Now we're going to compare with your right, okay? okay? So stand onto your right for now, please. Almost there. Good. There, you can rest. Great. When I say go, yep. you start walking, just walk natural, and then you land on your right. Great. Okay. Yeah. Turn around. Always the right, non-stop, okay? Okay, whenever you're ready, go. And I'll keep going. Always the right. And now we're gonna do the same with your left. Okay, now please go. So we're gonna do the same with it early, but we choose, okay? Okay. <clears throat> Okay, on the mat, and just look straight ahead. Good. Now we stand onto your left. Now onto your right. 
it's going to be good when we're going to compare with and without shoes. Interesting, yeah. All right, so now what we're going to do, we're going to start with the video analysis. Yep. We're going to use two of the video cameras. We're going to record a few videos focusing on your lower back, your pelvis, hips, knees, and ankles. We're going to do a bit of walking, a bit of running. Yep. It's going to be bare feet first, and then it's going to be with your trainers. Okay. Okay. Safety measures about this treadmill. Obviously, you run, so you've been on a treadmill before. Yeah. Anyway, but we don't have, obviously, a safety bar at the front, the ones like the gym ones, mostly, because it interacts with the camera. So we've got a safety hand but on the right-hand side. Okay. Yeah? If you need to hold it. The most important thing is if we walk slightly faster, we run, I want you to look down once in a while. Okay. Because I don't want you to go forward and trip over, okay? So yeah. look down once in a while, okay? So you're going to be walking first. Okay. And then it's going to be running, okay? Great. All right. Are you ready? I am. Okay. It's going to be walking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Starts with a bit of a kick. This yeah. Time. You okay with the speed? Yes, good. Okay, let's reach from 445. I'm happy with that. Okay, you're right there. Great. Now we're gonna increase the speed now. Okay. And we're gonna do a bit of running now, okay? Yep. You ready? I am. Now we start running. Reach eight. You're happy with that speed? Sounds good. Yeah. That's good. I'm going to stop. Great. Bit of exercise in the morning. <laughs> All good, isn't it? All right. So now, um, just put your trainers on. One of the trainers. Um, and no socks, please. Just the trainers. And we'll do the same now with shoes, okay? It's going to be walking first, okay? Okay. Ready? Same speed as earlier. Okay, I'm gonna increase the speed again, all right? Okay. So I'll run. Yep. Same speed as earlier. You see that blue dot on the wall? Just look at the blue dot on the wall opposite you. Gonna stop. Good. Well, I suggest to do well later when you have a chat with uh, Ron. Yep. Um, have a discussion with him the type of shoes you wear. Okay. The most important thing is with the test 
um, barefoot first. Yep. We tested with your running trainers, but then the rest of you wear obviously if you hike, walking boots, all the stuff of footwear. Just yep. have a chat with him. Yeah, great. Very good with footwear advice. Okay. Thank now you. Now we're gonna do uh, shoes off. And uh, we're going to do well, the exciting part, which is the 3D. Wow, that is so exciting. Stand on the board, facing that way. Two of the markers, they're going to be placed over your hips. So probably we have to put a little bit of tape. Let me see what's going to be the best way. Yep. Actually, yeah, maybe do it just like that. It's going to be easier. Perfect. Otherwise, when you start running or walking, it's going to cover the marker. So it's better to Perfect. put some tape. How many years has this service been available? Uh, we is probably, um, let me see, the, the actual, the, the gate analysis. Mm. The oh, the 3D one. The yeah. 3D one, yeah. It's been there. We've been using it. It was the, was the first clinics actually started using it. Oh, wow. Mr. McCulloch definitely can confirm that. That's cool. Um, they've definitely they probably had it born more than 15 years. Wow. Yeah. All right, that's brilliant. Just look straight ahead now. It's very important you look straight ahead. Okay. So you need to place the markers in the right place. All right. A lot of patients recognize the system because they see, obviously, in a movie industry, where they see those documentaries, where they're filming movies, um, they're wearing this special suit with a green oh, background. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, like it's, motion, it's, it's, it's capturing, it's motion capture. That's so clever. Yeah, it's motion capture. So we use it, obviously, to analyze uh, movement. Oh, wow. We find in the right. That is so cool. Just bend your knee a little bit. Now relax. This for us is important because we just use, obviously we like to really to focus a lot on the foot and ankle. Yeah. So for that, we have just a lot of cameras just looking at the foot. So that's why we need to use a model. We need to place a lot of markers on the foot itself. So we can analyze every plane of all the joints. Yeah. Do you have a lot of subscribers or followers or? Um, I just got 100,000 the other day. Oh, wow, it's good. Yeah. But yeah, I work hard at it. I mean, it's a, it's a full-time job. Yeah, <laughs> especially <laughs> yeah. with no camera person. We don't have a hell with the cameras, yeah. <laughs> I'm doing it, I'm having acupuncture tomorrow, but yeah. I've ha I'm hiring somebody to help. To do it, okay. Yeah. But actually people prefer me in a weird way doing it all Do, by doing myself it all, yeah. because uh, it's more yeah it's more, they feel, you know, more real they feel more that i'm a normal person a, rather than like it to, to edit it and to yeah like, so then sometimes if the yeah. camera is a bit wonky or yeah <laughs> it's, it, it almost is, doesn't is matter more, it's more real yeah let's bend your knee a little bit now relax So we get in there. That's the tibial tuberosity. So as we place, depends the models we use um, on the system, we place the markers in different places. Oh, right. So this is the model we use for the advanced one. 
That's why you need so many markers. Yeah, <laughs> mecca. Right, so the hallux. Right, so the thief. Toe joint. Second. Very cool. Yes, first. Oh, good job there, quite robust. <laughs> Thank you. I already uh, have an idea about how my foot acts when I run, when so it'll be run. interesting to see it. If you see that, yeah. Oh, well, definitely you got a pronated foot, so definitely your foot rolls in like excessively, yeah. Does it? Yeah, and that probably does form. You got the very early stages of a bunion as well. Mm. That usually happens. There's a lot of reasons behind it, but mechanically, if someone has a pronated foot, usually in time it could develop into into a big toe dysfunction, which is a little bit of angulation of the big toe. Yeah, because the bunion is yeah. Do you see this bone is going this way and this bone is going that way? Yeah, I can, yeah. I've okay. stopped wearing narrow shoes as well. And uh, high heels and things. Now what we're going to do, I just want to show you a pair of these. Ready? Yep. That's good. Now we're in a bit, we're gonna start running, okay? Okay. Okay, so running. It's gonna be gentle jog first. A few more seconds. Great, I'm gonna stop. Standard, I wanna just quickly check your bank. Just look straight ahead. Yeah, that's fine. That's just so cool, isn't it? Yeah, go for it. So basically, this is the. We've now turned you into a kind of a mechanical uh, 3D uh, person, and you can see, you know, we can evaluate this uh, from all angles. And but obviously, what this now does is gives us all the data, so we can now measure through numerical uh, kind of quantitative information exactly what your knee is doing, how much it's bending, uh, what your plantar fascia is doing in terms of. For example, there's a big connection between how much your big toe joint bends and when your plantar fascia gets gets loaded normally or abnormally. Now, the vast majority of uh, gait analysis uh, or, or practitioners performing gait analysis in, in the UK won't have this level of technology, but this is what really uh, makes it a very scientific process. You know, where we can really measure things rather than just observe. So there are lots of uh, there's lots of graphs and things that will come from this and I look forward to talking to you about all the results and uh, figuring, out, figuring out exactly why you're getting your plantar fasciitis on that right side. Yeah, that'd be great. There is a bit of tenderness on the fascia, mm -hmm. that correct? Okay. And that isn't on this side. That feels, like, that feels very different. 
So the fascia is a little bit tender. Um, if I then ultrasound scan it, and ultrasound is an excellent way of assessing the fascia, it looks entirely normal. So uh, by that, what I mean is um, it is uniform in its appearance. There's no areas of what we call hypoechogenicity, which is basically uh, a black discoloration, and that's typically what you see when there are small tears or damage to the fascia. So if I measure the fascia now, you will see that um, it does measure normal thickness at 2.1 millimeters. Anything below 4 millimeter is normal. There is also no fusiform swelling, which is what happens when you suddenly get a bit of thickening. It's, um, it's not there. So the good news is you've got low-grade irritation of the fascia, but it's not causing any significant damage, which is much better for the prognosis because we now know you know, if there's no serious damage, that dealing with the reasons why this is occurring uh, is more likely to work in terms of a conservative treatment approach. In other words, injections and things like that are very unlikely to be needed. Yeah. But the big question now is, what is it about your gait, about your biomechanics, that is loading the fascia? We know that the fascia, or loading the fascia excessively, we know that the fascia is responsible for supporting the arch. So we may find that maybe your right foot is less stable from a pronation perspective. Pronation really means excessive collapse of the arch and ankle when the foot should be more stable. Yeah. But there could be other reasons. It might not be that. It may be that you're a little bit um, tighter on the right side. So one simple test I'm going to do is just to assess your uh, tension on the back of your leg by just doing this. Well, how much ten where do you feel the tension and how much would you say when I do this? Not really any. Anyway. No? That's fine. So really it's the same as this, would you say? No difference at all. Okay. So if you had a little bit more tension running on the back of the right leg, that would already indicate that maybe you're tightening up a bit on the right, and that's the reason why your fascia is loading. It's only one test of many that we've done, but it immediately tells me that maybe it isn't a, a tension problem, it's more to do with the stability of the foot. Yeah. But what we'll do is we'll go through the gait analysis in due course, once all the information has been processed, you've had a very advanced uh, form of gait analysis, including full 3D. So from that, we, no stone is left unturned. It's very likely we're going to be able to find out why you're getting this problem. And of course, if we know why this problem is occurring, we're much more likely to be able to resolve it. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay. And it kind of, it comes up into, and then it just like but a buzz. Like yeah. Into here almost. Yeah. Mm. It's a sucky, mm, like a shooty electrical pain. Yeah. Up. There might be a little bit of a nervy element to it as well then. But it is tender, so you know that's the key point. There must be something slightly irritating because otherwise it wouldn't be tender, yeah. you know, in that area. We're just going to go through uh, the uh, gait analysis results now. So um, just to just to remind you that you've you've got this right arch pain, and we uh, I performed an ultrasound scan, and it didn't reveal any significant uh, thickening of the uh, plantar fascia, even though the suggestion has been made that you've got plantar fasciitis which is this common condition where a ligament under the foot becomes strained and it becomes enlarged, often in association with instability of the foot. The one other thing about your right foot is that you have a slight increased bunion formation where the big toe is going over and that does affect the function of the fascia. So the point is, even though the ultrasound scan was normal, which is great, it doesn't mean that you haven't got some low grade stress of the fascia. And on balance, that's probably what you do have because that area is tender. And one of the risk factors is if your big toe isn't straight and it's going over at an angle, it will actually hinder the normal function of the fascia. And so that could be a fact. Okay, just to, but this is really looking at your whole biomechanical profile. Obviously, we also did static measurements. Just to remind you, your calf flexibility was very good, actually. It was a, um, only slightly different between the left and right. And something called the knee to wall test, which assesses your flexibility, was above 11 on both. So um, this is one of the reasons why you do okay with barefoot shoes. If you actually had poor results in that test, then that shoe would have caused you a lot of problems, but um, that's not the case. But if we just run through it, you can see here that you're right. I mean, this is what we do is when we do gait analysis, we do some subjective testing where we basically look at you, we video you, we look at the pictures, we look to see what's going on. What, what it's like, you know, what are the instinctive things that we think are going on? That's very prone to human error, but it's still quite valuable to do because we can use that information and then start seeing with the more technical information, we've got the objective measurement information where we're at and whether the things we're seeing are actually happening. Um, and if not, then we have to double check a few things and make sure that we've got enough evidence to suggest that a certain biomechanical presentation is actually what's occurring. Okay. So it's building up an evidence base. You don't ever really rely on one bit of data when you're looking at gait analysis. You, you look for the evidence in different areas to make sure it's definitely what we think. So if we look at your pelvis, you can see that if you were just to look at the short, so this obviously splits the, 
the body in half and, and across. And you can see that if you were to just look at, for example, the amount of pelvic tilt, your shorts are quite level here. And on the left, you can see your shorts are angled and you seem to have more left pelvic tilt. OK, but when you drop your um, this is when you maximally drop your left hip. This is when you actually drop your right hip. OK, and then but if we look at the shift of your head, your head clearly looks straighter here than it does here. Wow. Here it's more deviated. Now, that's just an observation. We can look to see how relevant that is. And in fact, what I'm going to do is go straight to the 3D analysis now whilst we've got this image in our head so we can actually see. So we're saying increased left pelvic tilt. So if we then go to all of the vice, so this is the three dimensional data where we put markers and the compute tracks your body. It's, as I've said, it's the sort of technology used in, um, you know, special effects movies and medical research. Um, so if we look at you, uh, for example, walking, what I'm interested in is this graph. Now this graph looks at your pelvis and we can see that the red line, which is the left, is lower. So that, this is over all of the steps you've taken and this is far more scientific. So it shows that your left pelvis does drop more than your right. Mm. So it suggests some potential instability and weakness on both sides, actually. And we'll look more about, but in relation to the pelvis and the hip, we've already made some observations, which I'll talk about later. But this also suggests that you should strengthen your right, or at least that your right is having to work hard to control that left pelvic tilt. Because at this, where, at this stage, your left leg is not on the ground. So this, is, this left hip drop can only be controlled by the right side. So what this practically means is that you need some strengthening work around your core to address that. Okay. Um, but it just shows that the, what we think we're seeing is actually happening because it's supported by the measurements. So if we look through here, I just want to draw your attention here to something that I think is probably, you know, the, the most significant, bearing in mind that nobody is biomechanically perfect, the most significant mechanical imperfection, if you like, in your, in your gait, in your setup is this. Now, if you look at this big toe, you can see it here on the left side and you can't see it on the right. During normal gait, when you're looking directly behind the patient, you shouldn't be able to be see the big toe. This means that your foot is moving in. <clears throat> now, we don't, at this stage, know why that's happening. Is that coming from the foot? Is it coming from the knee? Is it coming from the hip? It's coming from the hip, and we know that because I'll show you that in a moment. No, that could just be a, a dodgy step. You might just have landed badly. But if we look at this in shoes, it's happening again. That makes me a bit more suspicious that we're looking here at an imbalance where you're very much in toe on the left side. And this happens a lot in kids that I see. So kids and parents will come in and they'll be concerned that their child is intoning on one side. And then the literature will often say, um, oh yeah, but it'll be outgrown. By the time the child is an adult, you won't see that somewhat. And that's true. But the only caveat to that is that the child doesn't usually outgrow it. They outcompensate it. Mm -hmm. So they do other things to get around it, which hides it. But it doesn't mean that it's been completely corrected. And in your case, I suspect that when you were a child, it might have been more obvious. Now we have to start looking at it in a bit more detail during gait analysis to see it, you know. But there is this intel on the left side. So now my question about that is, well, what's going on? Why is that happening? So what I do is I go and look at your 3D data and I think to myself, OK, well, let's have a look at the hip rotation, because the most likely thing is that this is coming from the hip, because that has a very powerful rotational effect on the foot. It's very unlikely that the foot could move enough to make that into so obvious. And in fact, when we look at the hip, we can see that the left hip is rotating inwards because a positive value is more inward rotated. You can see inward rotation, it says there. So you so we now know that you have a, an issue with that left hip where you've got too much inward rotation. And then I ask you some further questions and you, in fact, explain that that hip does feel a bit abnormal and a bit restricted. Now, what normally happens when that happens is that um, there is a slight alteration in the normal development of the hip and the femur. Sometimes you can get femoral rotation or torsion, the femur is the big thigh bone, where it's just rotated inwards more than it should have done during your development. And sometimes it can be to do with the angle of the hip joint. And also it can be to do with, if you've got a slight restricted movement, which you have on that left side, it can be to do with the way that the joint sits inside the socket and that can affect it. But we know now that this is... Uh, significant because it's an obvious asymmetry and the reason why it's important is because we talked earlier about you know cause and effect what what is the primary issue here and what are the secondary things you know what's actually the underlying issue if any you know so this is an underlying issue this wouldn't happen you wouldn't in tow as a result of something else you know that's very unlikely so 
obviously the way that you would treat this is to encourage outward rotation of the hip and you can do stretching and strengthening work to do that but i suspect that you'll never fully get rid of this because this is just you and it has secondary effects on your gait because it will make your pelvis drop more on the left side which is exactly what's happened and it's also so you know you could say well if you can't do anything about it well you know what's the point of it all? but you can do things about it because you can strengthen and control and deal with these problems you just can't necessarily fully correct it but now we know where to uh, focus our strategies with regards to for example strengthening and rehabilitation so let's just go back so we've looked at uh, your foot position now one of the interesting things is that you were wearing these uh, was it vibram barefoot or i think so vivo barefoot shoes and these shoes um, are obviously very minimalistic shoes. And the question was, is this really a shoe that you should be wearing, uh, especially because you've got low grade plantar fasciitis? And we know that patients with plantar fasciitis often have tight calves. And if they've got tight calves and you give them a totally flat shoe, puts more tension on the calf, makes the plantar fasciitis worse. So, but we know that in your case, your flexibility was actually, you know, good anyway. So there was already a reason to think you could probably cope or okay with this shoe. But, but one of the really useful ways of assessing the effect of the shoe is to put hundreds and hundreds of sensors inside it and function and look at the function of your feet. And that's what we did here. So if you look at, for example, this curve, now this is not a terrible curve, but basically this is the force time curve. You can imagine a scale somehow secured to the bottom of your foot. When you first hit the ground, you get a big peak of force. Then as you pass through the middle, obviously because you're sort of halfway, you don't have as much force. And then when you push off, you get another big peak and that creates an sinusoidal curve, we call it, basically an M-shaped curve. And the perfect curve should be M-shaped. So if we look at you, you can see here that your curve is actually not bad at all, but there is this blip at the beginning where you've got low force on the green side here. You can see that, you have a green being the left side. Um, and other than that, the symmetry isn't too bad. What we can also see, actually, one of the things I'm interested in, this curve here is your heel. It should stay in contact to about here, which is 60%. Yes. Interestingly, on the right, you lift your heel up earlier. And that's very significant because if you lift your heel up early, you'll stress the plantar fascia more. Okay, so the question then was, well, what happens where you wear the, the, the Vivos? Is that going to make all of this worse or is it going to actually be okay? In which case, if it makes it worse, we have to recommend a different shoe. Now, what's actually happened here is that this curve, look how irregular it is. Look at the differences here. Now, look at this curve. It does look better. There's a slight imperfection at the end, but that is generally a more symmetrical, smoother curve. So there's no evidence. If anything, there's evidence this shoe is improving your force time curve. And that's really an indicator of your general function. You know, this is not looking at the minutiae of your feet. This is the total force coming down in your body. Now, the interesting thing is when we look at the heel loading time, I mentioned before that it was slightly early on the right, so it stops in the middle of these two bars here, left last. It perfects when you wear your by when you wear your shoe, your uh, Vivo Barefoot trainers. So therefore, we've got objective evidence that these shoes are actually enhancing your biomechanical function. Wow! So that makes me quite happy, and that makes me happy. Yeah. Well, I, I, the thing is, a lot of the time it's quite difficult because sometimes people do come in and they have, you know barefoot shoes and it just isn't the right shoe for them and sometimes it's the opposite you know sometimes they don't want a shoe like that but it's actually a, a good shoe for them so it really just depends that graph that was up here uh the next one yeah up, do you think that could be a, um contributed by the left hip too? yeah definitely because you're going to load with your heel with your whole foot's loading differently on the on the outside so that would definitely make you more shaky and less stable and that probably is one of the reasons why it's happened so this is where we can do measurements so what could happen is you could have you know uh some rehab and we can make some changes um and we can talk about various ways of that can be achieved and then we might we could redo the test and see whether it's improved the infant and bare feet because obviously ideally you want to just be really efficient without any shoes whatsoever okay so um let's have a look at some other information um the oh the one thing i would say about this is that we're looking here at symmetry which is great but one of the things that we've noticed with the right foot is that when we look at the collapse of the heel it did seem okay so let me go back to vicon graphs here 
the, this is a graph that looks at the amount of collapse. Okay, now actually in terms of timing, you're 53 on the left, 55 on the right. That's how long you're collapsed for in terms of the ankle collapsing in. And um, um, it does appear that you are a bit more collapsed on the right than the right, pronated on the right. So even though you've got this vivo shoe, there are some that are more stable than others, or you could consider as something to maybe control the foot a little bit inside the shoe. It could be something very simple, doesn't have to be anything sophisticated, but just to try and get these values closer. Um, okay, so let's have a look at some, some other things. What are you, I think as we were talking about shoes, I'd just like to bring your attention to one other thing about shoes. Um, we also did something called postural sway analysis. And what we did was we, what postural sway analysis is, uh, I think I explained it to you. You imagine a pen on the top of your head and a piece of paper. When you're trying to stand still, everybody sways. You know, you can't help but do that. And the more you sway, the less good your balance is. And when you're looking at neurological conditions like Parkinson's, we see people with really bad sway or MS. And so sometimes we'll see values where we think, well, actually, this is totally, totally outside and we maybe need to look at a neurological opinion. But in this case, we want, we want the values in the ideal patient to be below 35 centimeters. When you're in bare feet, you score 36, nearly 37. So that's not terrible. You know, it's it's not brilliant, but it's not terrible. Now, what is actually a lot better is when you stand on one foot, because it should be below 100, and you're 64 centimeters on the left and 53 on the right. Mm -hmm. We'd expect the left to be worse because the left is your kind of weak side with the hip and everything else. And what's interesting is that we also did this test in Vivo Barefoot Shoes. And of course, I was very interested to see whether we could maintain the good results from these shoes. So in fact, when we tested you in both feet with the Vivo shoes, you, you went to 28, down to 28. Remember you were 36 before. Wow. So you've significantly improved in balance just by wearing that type of shoe, which actually gives you no support at all. But I think it's more about proprioceptive awareness. And when you have something around your foot, it does provide you with more biofeedback. You've mm. got more bits in contact with your foot that can provide sensory feedback. And that may be one of the reasons why that happens, you know. Um, and just to show it wasn't some kind of coincidence, you also appear to have um, good stability on standing on one foot and the other. So you've got, you've got, you've still got good results there. So let's just have a look at a few other bits of data. Um, now we, we tested you walking by the way, and we tested you running and all the data that we noted with you walking across during running of course, with running, it's different and it's worse in some cases because, you know, you're putting more stress through the body. But when we look at the results, there's, there's still left hip drop. You're still inwardly rotating your left hip. Wow. You know, there's two areas where, um, which I haven't discussed yet, which I just wanted to go through. So can I ask one quick question? Yeah, sure. Even if I was, say, if I'm walking and I was to consciously external rotate that left yes. hip microscopically, is, would that be a good thing or is no um so that's a really interesting question because lots of people think about that you, you can't the, the problem is people can't do that subtly mm. if what you think is a subtle bit of is actually going to be dramatic and it's going to fry out your gait what you got to remember is this is your body's best attempt to function wow. nothing that you do here is you know it's it's all done with purpose. It's because this is the best way you can function. Yeah. So so simply trying to correct it will just cause another issue. You yes. know, so correct it. No yeah, thing. correct it by all means by doing strengthening, proprioceptive work, core work, shoes, maybe even orthotics. But you don't um, correct it by consciously changing it. It just does not work because you're doing it for a reason. Yeah. You know. Your body is great. Yeah. Your hip hasn't got the movement. That's why you don't. So. <laughs> trying to force it will just cause another problem. Yeah. Trying to do work to increase your hip rotation over a period of months, sure, that's great. Um, so, but also your left hip doesn't move behind your body as much. We call that left hip extension. And that's what this red line shows here. And that happens during running and walking. And also there's quite a lot of asymmetry in your knee function as you run. And again, that's because you can't have an asymmetry in your hip and your pelvis without it affecting your knee. It just, it's a natural progression. So you don't quite have the same function on the left knee. But if we see improvements in one, we tend to see improvements in the other. It's all part of the kinetic, kinetic chain. The other thing that was quite interesting is that when we tested you with Vicon, we tested you in bare feet. Um, when we looked at the, my, the real detail of your foot function. And one of the reasons for that is that um, we can't measure the joint segments of your foot if you're wearing a shoe. 
obviously they all have to be moving freely. So therefore, you know, if we're putting markers all over your, your foot, you would lose most of the data if you were in a shoe. So that's why a lot of this is in bed. And also we want to know what you function like before everything, anything influences it. But what this does show very significantly, I think, is that your right ankle, it, it moves up okay, but it moves downward prematurely. And that again relates to the fascia. Mm. And we've already said that you lift your heel up early. And this is basically showing the same thing that you are, you know, bringing your foot in a downwards position prematurely on that right side. Um, now that might be better when you wear your Vivo shoes. We don't know because we can't measure that when you wear your Vivo shoes, but we can measure it with pressure analysis and the pressure analysis would suggest strongly it does improve because your heel loading time is, is fine with fine. pressure analysis. But this, you know, you can look at the ankle indirectly by seeing how long the heel stays on the ground, which is a pressure analysis. But this is a movement analysis. This is literally looking at how much the ankle moves, you know. And a lot of what you have identified in these tests reflects the mobility tests that I had with Sam last yes. year. That all, to you, that is all aligned and makes perfect sense. Yes, I had a look at that and I will do another follow-up report because I already looked at it and it was it was very interesting how he did uh, functional testing and how well that correlated with a number of the imbalances that we're seeing during gait. Now, the reason why that is so important is as follows. I'd love to do your gait analysis every four weeks <laughs> over a period of a year to see how things go. The reality is that if you're self-funding, it's a lot of money. If you're under insurance, the insurance might pay for it once, but they're not going to keep paying for it. So the question is, how do we measure to see whether these things are improving? Mm. Well, the answer is to have an indirect way of measuring it. So if there's a functional test that he does that reflects what we're seeing here, then all we have to do is see an improvement in that functional test and the likelihood is that your gait will prove as, improve as well. And of course, we can do the gait again in six months or a year's time because it'll take six months to see the improvements. These you know, as I think you mentioned earlier, these things have taken a lifetime to develop. They're not going to change over a period of a few weeks of doing some exercise. You need to do something for a quite a long, prolonged period, you know. Yeah. And as soon as you know that and you're thinking, gosh, that hip is so much better now, you can then think, OK, well, this maybe is the time to do a gait analysis. And we'll, we should do that because that will be a very interesting thing to do as a follow up report to see whether how much we can physically change some of these variables and the thing to do is to obviously do that particularly in bare feet where you're not being influenced by shoes or anything it's purely you and the rehab you're doing in terms of my test results would you say that i was is it is there is it a concern or is it just more of like like mm, it's not great we could do better yeah um it's a really good question it's a it's a really important one because if you go, I don't know, to a, a hospital department and you go to orthopedics and they do a, a, a general orthopedic, they're probably going to say there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. yeah, They're not going to pick up. But these are subtleties. But that doesn't mean they're not relevant. We are biological machines. And, you know, um, people often wonder, well, why did, you know, why does one person develop arthritis in their knee or in their hip at the age of 60 and another one doesn't? Now, of course, that could be hormonal, it could be you know, osteoporosis, it could be all sorts of things. But one of the major factors is going to be the biomechanics. Mm. So this is fairly minor. You know, none of this is really major at all. But that doesn't mean it's not relevant. And the relevance of it depends on what you do as well. If you do marathon running, this is likely to cause you some issues at some point. Mm. If you're a swimmer, it's very unlikely to cause you any issues. You know, so it's all about how, and it's the effects of time. I get lots of people saying to me, well, this is all very interesting, but I've had this all my life. You know, I might, the analogy I give is, look, it's like somebody saying, I've got high blood pressure and, or telling, you know, or saying you've got high blood pressure and the person, and saying, well, you should stop eating cream cakes. And the person saying, well, I've eaten cream cakes all my life. How can that be the reason? It's a cumulative effect. It's another analogy is if you bought a new car and it was perfect, except for a slight angle on the axle, that you won't notice that for the first 100,000 miles or whatever, or 50,000 miles. But eventually you'll start to appreciate, you know, something not being quite right. And I think that's the thing about the human body. We're, it's, very, it's very able to, to tolerate and to adapt and to accommodate. And sometimes when you have a mechanical imbalance like this, for example, when you get an injury, simply changing what you're doing can be enough or just changing the mechanical environment can be like a rest. But sometimes that's not enough. And of course, especially in people who are athletes, it becomes very relevant because, you know, an athlete, there's not going to be many other things that pretend they're not going to be obese you know they're not going to have all sorts of other 
factors that are going to be influencing them. So these, these type of uh, individuals are very susceptible to mechanical imbalance. And that's why I spend so much time dealing with professional athletes, because it not only can small imbalances in biomechanics have a profound effect on injury because they function at such a high level, but small changes can also make a, a big difference. Again, if you're, you know, if you're obese and out of shape and you've got all sorts of different health problems, small changes may not have as much of an impact because there are so many other factors that are going to be causing your injury or contributing towards your injury. You know, that doesn't mean it may not make a difference. Sometimes, you know, even in a patient who has got all sorts of problems, just rechanging and retuning the biomechanics can be enough, you know. Yeah, I love, I love the analogy about the car. And yeah. actually, 42-year-old Laura, I'm functioning pretty well. Yeah. I'm doing my strength training and getting stronger. But 72-year-old Laura might be that car that's been driven for 200,000 yeah, miles. And you may and just, and like if you wonder why your hips does start to play up a bit more, you know why now. But at yeah. least you've got the tools to try and do what you can to protect it. Yeah, that's you what know? I'm thinking, a good bit of maintenance. Yes. And good knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. And I would like to ask you, if for those watching who might not be able to visit you for location reasons or finance mm. or for whatever reason, what could people do in their own day-to-day -day life that you might not even be able to answer this? What can people do in their day-to-day -day life to potentially improve their body geometry and walking and running gait without maybe having an analysis? Yeah, I think, well, you know, um, there, there, there's certainly a lot of information on the web, but it's mm. making sure that you get the right information, you know, and obviously you can easily be led down a path which might make you anxious or, you know, um, I mean, I'm doing a lot more YouTube videos, but they're quite specialized in a specific condition I deal with, which I've mentioned to you. Um, but I think the answer is, is, is probably there are a number of simple tests you can do to uh, evaluate your own function and, you know, simply putting a, a board at, at an angle, you know, under an inch block and standing on it and seeing whether you can physically do that is already a very simple test for calf flexibility being able to efficiently go up on one toe several times. So there are lots of functional tests you can do. So, I mean, I think ideally it is good to see somebody, you know, it's good to see, uh, for example, a podiatric specialist who deals in biomechanics. It's good to see a physio who deals in biomechanics. Um, particularly, um, I think those two practitioners, because they deal a lot with looking at that side of things. Obviously, once you've got an injury, especially, then certain other practitioners, osteopathic chiropractors are very valuable as well. Um, but having somebody who's into the biomechanics and who can assess you is the ideal way. And if not, then there is a lot of information on, on the web. But I think you've almost, you, by asking that question, you've kind of opened up the whole area of maybe I should expand what I do on YouTube to give people basic tests that they can do to improve their, or to have an understanding of their posture and then saying, well, you can't do this, therefore you need to do that. You know, there are also things you can do, basic things like, for example, a simple evaluation of the shoe you know so people get very um excited about wear and they'll look at the shoe and see where the wear patterns are what's far more important is if you're looking at a shoe you put it flat on the table and you see whether if you can imagine a line being drawn down the back of that shoe and normally many shoes have a seam down the line to use if that shoe is in any way tilted in this direction or that direction that's not normal. Right. Now, it could be that you've had that shoe for 20 years. Fair enough. That's obviously a factor. But, you know, if you're finding that your shoes are wearing out, um, sorry, wearing down and compressing and looking angled in, this is called eversion, this is called inversion, change your shoe. If that's happening a lot, or even more importantly, if it's happening more on one side than the other, you definitely have a biomechanical issue and you need to explore it. Mm. So if you have a shoe that tends to collapse in this way, you need a stability shoe, an anti-pronation shoe, and there are lots on the market. Okay, I actually do this, and this is a AC Piano shoe, which is, you know, um, which is very stable. Okay, if you have a foot that tends to do this, a shoe that tends to do this, this would be the worst shoe for you yeah. because this shoe is designed to stop you from doing this. So it would actually encourage this. So there's very simple tests you can do with just looking at a shoe. The one example, this one, um, that will provide a lot of information. You know, um, and yeah, I think one of our roles is probably to try and be more helpful with videos showing those things. And yeah. I think um, that's certainly something I'm going to be doing. In the future. And for people to understand that something in the foot, it, I think sometimes the thought can be, well, that's a problem in my foot. 
but it, it travels all the way up the body, doesn't it? Yeah. To the knee, to the hip, into yeah. the pelvis, up into the... Well, this, this is proof. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think in this case, you know, the question is, now you could have come to me with a collapsed left foot and everything could be the result of the foot. In your case, the, the, case, the focal area is the hip, the left hip. That's what's, you know, that's the primary issue here. Um, but um, you have to try and pinpoint and find the primary issue. Now, I remember um, a number of years ago, there was a, a book on the lower, lower extremity biomechanics, I think it was called, and it was by uh, an American doctor called Subotnik. Mm. Um, and it, it was, it's pretty old now, but he had something called miserable alignment syndrome, right. which, which is actually what, what you were kind of referring to. So if somebody stands and their left arch collapses significantly, they will have a rotation, inward rotation of their leg. Their knee potentially, it might not actually look like it is, but it will have a strain where it's almost going into a knock knee position. The left hip will drop. Because the left hip drops, if you think about it, you know, most people try and keep their head straight. Nobody walks with their head like that. Yeah. So if your left hip drops, you have to then move your neck to the right oh, wow. yeah. to deal with that. And that leads into all sorts of interesting areas like temporomandibular joint dysfunction. So this is malalignment of the jaw, giving rise to early wear of teeth. I'm, I'm not a dentist, but certainly, um, you know, we know that it can cause issues with uh, uh, pain and comfort of the jaw and neck pain and torticollis That's and all those wild. things. Yeah. And from it all the, you could you, the yeah arch of the foot. yeah you could argue yeah absolutely so a collapsed arch on one side will make you drop your hip will make you realign your shoulders and your neck and will give you an alteration in your normal jaw alignment and there are dentists who actually are very into that and I I have patients who are dentists who who have come to me and said oh can we discuss this what what that is crazy a simpler way actually is to just have a leg length difference I mean if you've got a leg length difference that's going to happen even more because a, a one foot being flattened than another is effectively causing a slight leg length difference mm -hmm. but lots of people have a leg length difference um I believe it was the same yes yeah. I would have mentioned that before it. yes he kept testing yes it. he's like oh we couldn't work it out and then and then he, and then uh, he I can retest right. you again in a minute but I'm pretty sure it was okay because I would have made a thing of that if it hadn't been yeah um but um um a leg length difference is very common you mm -hmm. know I mean probably one in ten patients has some level of leg length discrepancy that I see and that can be a, a major factor again it's not you know, I had a chap today, he's a marathon runner and he keeps getting injured on one side. He's got an obvious one centimeter leg length difference. That's wow. going to be enough to explain the nature of his injury. It's not a huge difference, but it, it's enough yeah. for, for somebody who runs marathons because it's so repetitive. You know, that left hip is dropping that extra bit every single wow. step. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Amazing stuff. All of it is totally fascinating. Good. More Good than time. I ever could have imagined. Yeah. It, so thank you. Well, it's always been such a fascinating area for me, you know, I mean, yeah. even though, you know, I qualified as a surgeon, I spent a lot of time, you know, operating, this will always be a, a big part of my practice because it's just so, uh, so interesting. And it it's in many ways, fascinating. more challenging and more academically kind of challenging to try and figure out what's going on in the surgery. Yeah, yeah. it's great. I love it. Thank yeah. you so much.